So, there were six stone jars. Six stone jars just sitting there by the entrance. Really big stone jars. Each capable of holding 20 or 30 gallons. When the mother of Jesus called his attention, crisis. They were at a wedding. A wedding taking place in the village of Cana in Galilee. A wedding that was no doubt about the biggest event that would take place in Cana that season. And life in Cana, life in most any Galilean village at that time, was pretty miserable. It was just a hard, scrabble existence where people had to work from dusk to dawn just to get enough to survive. According to some calculations, these people saw about 90% of everything that they produced sucked away from them in taxes and rents and fees and support of the temple and religion in Judea. So opportunities to celebrate, opportunities just to enjoy yourself, were few and far between. And so when on the third day of the wedding, the wine ran out, the third day of a festival that was to, supposed to last a week, it was a crisis. The very morale of the entire region was on the line. This wedding would probably be the only time these people would get to feel as if life was worth living. And it was suddenly over. But more than that was at stake. Because, you see, Jesus had just arrived. And Jesus had come into the world as the bridegroom. Jesus says on a number of occasions throughout his ministry in various Gospels that he was present as the bridegroom, and as the bridegroom that meant that wherever he went, a spirit of celebration had to spring up. On one occasion, some very religious people came up to Jesus, and they asked him, why is it that your disciples don't fast? Why is it that they don't go around with sad, long faces all the time? And Jesus explained, well, it's easy. It's not fitting. If we're at a funeral, fine. Then it would be all right to be sad. But the bridegroom's here. So we have to celebrate. Jesus, in the world, was a living embodiment of what we read in our Old Testament reading this morning, that as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Jesus was present, the party was on. So what would it look like for the party to come to a grinding halt due to lack of wine at the very moment when Jesus had arrived? So Jesus Reputation, his ministry, his identity was on the line. So as much as Jesus wanted him to protest and say, no, it's too early, my time hasn't come, as much as he did protest to his mother, no, it's too soon, he really had no choice. Jesus had to do something. So Jesus... Jesus is Son of God. Jesus is, is the Christ come into the world. Jesus could have done anything at this point, right? He had the power. We all agree on that. I guess he could have just made the wine to appear out of nothing. Wine and vessels and everything. He could have done it, right? But he did not do that. He chose to make the wine supply come in a very particular way. And there was the problem. A big problem. Because you see, there were these six stone jars. Really big star jars. 
each containing 20 or 30 gallons. And they were just sitting there. But you need to understand exactly why those jars were there. They had a very particular purpose. It's not the purpose that you might imagine. Now you remember how when you were growing up your mother taught you that you should always wash your hands before a meal? That, that if you didn't do so you might get sick, you might make other people sick, it was that important? Well those six stone jars had nothing to do with that. They were not there for the sake of hygiene. People in the world at that time didn't even understand the need for hygiene. No, they were there for a very different reason. And that reason had to do with religion and ritual. Basically, they were there so that these poor Galilean peasants could live up to the expectations of the Judeans who lived in the south and who thought that they knew everything about what God wanted from people. And so the Judeans had taught the Galileans that they had to do these elaborate rituals with water in order to be acceptable to God and to them. So they were there for religious and ritual purposes alone. And that is significant because of what Jesus does to them. Jesus chooses to use those six stone jars to provide the wine to keep the party going. But here's the thing. Wine is a drink that is made with yeast. Yeast is unclean, impure in Judean religion. So basically, by making wine in those jars, Jesus had just compromised those jars. They could no longer be used for their intended purpose. That was serious. Jesus had just basically destroyed, or at least temporarily destroyed, important ritual practices in order to just keep the party going. And what's more, he did that without asking permission. He did it without telling anyone what he was doing. And we're told that when the wine was taken to the steward and he was given it to taste, he didn't know where it came from. He didn't know it came from the six stone jars. Nobody knew. Oh wait, that's not quite right, is it? Somebody knew. The servants knew, the ones who had drawn the water, they knew. And I'll bet they thought it was hilarious. Because you know what? What did they care about the rituals and the practices of their masters and betters? I bet that those servants were sniggering under their breath as they gave that wine to the steward. <laughs> he doesn't know where that came from. He doesn't know what Jesus just did to his precious purification jars. Wait till he finds out. So what Jesus did was really serious. A serious bridge of tradition, ritual, religious practice. All just to keep a party going. And what's more, the Gospel of John tells us that this wasn't just something that Jesus did, it was a sign. It was a sign. What does John mean by that? Well, that's something that John says seven times in his gospel. There are seven signs that Jesus performs in his gospel. And these signs are not merely miracles. I mean, they're all miraculous in nature, but they're more than just miracles. If you look at them one by one, you realize that every one of these special actions that Jesus takes is intended to reveal something really important about who Jesus is and what he has come to accomplish. So in other words, John is telling us, we need to pay very, very close attention to 
everything that Jesus does at this wedding in Cana, it all has very significant meaning. The meaning seems to be this. Jesus is present. The bridegroom is present. The party is on. The spirit of celebration and joy must continue. And if there's anything getting in the way, maybe especially anything particularly religious or ritual or traditional in nature, must be compromised. Now the question is, what does all this have to do with us? This is what Jesus did a long time ago in Cana of Galilee, but how do we apply that to the life of the church today? Well, I think the application is pretty clear. The church should be typified by joy. Joy should be the prominent note in the life of the church in the song of the church. Because the church is the bride of Christ. And if the, if the church is the bride of Christ, then we are the living embodiment of that saying from the prophet. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And so if there's anything in the life of the church that is preventing us from living out that joy, from living out our mission and identity in joy, guess what? That thing needs to be compromised. So what in the life of the church today might be getting in the way of us living out our joy, the joy that we are called to live? I'll tell you what's in the way. Six stone jars. Six things. I'm going to give you six things that I think maybe stand in the way of us living up to our identity and joy in Christ, our mission and life in Christ. Six things. Number one, first jar. What is it that saps the joy and the life in the church today? Number one, I would say, is spirit of scarcity. I mean, that's what's going on at the, the wedding in, in, in Cana, right? There is a scarcity. The wine runs out. It creates fear. It creates lack. It creates need. And it stops the joy on the life of the party. So a spirit of scarcity, a spirit of, of, of focusing on what we lack, stops the joy in the life of the church. What does that, how does that happen? Well, often when things do run short, when money runs short in the church, we can fall into a spirit of scarcity. But I've noticed something. That the spirit of scarcity can be stronger than the actual lack of resources. And just let's say something really amazing were to happen to a congregation. Say that at the end of the year, you know, they, they added up everything that had happened throughout the year, and at the end of the year, the budget was paid. All expenses had been covered. There was no lack of money at the end of the thing. God had provided for that church, yet again, proving God's faithfulness. Amazingly, that can happen to a congregation, and that congregation can still be possessed by a spirit of scarcity that saps from it its, its power to live up to its mission, that pulls from it its joy. Because when we, we let that spirit of scarcity take control of us, it constrains us. It keeps us from being all that we are meant to be. And I don't mean by that that we should just give up on you know, financial prudence and careful planning. Of course not. When that spirit of scarcity becomes that strong note in the life of a congregation, it will sap us of our joy that we are meant to have. Jar number two. I'm going to call this jar 
formality. Now churches can have a certain formality, a certain value for, for various forums and traditions that have been built up over the years. And these forums and traditions, they may be well, very well be very good things. You know, being formal at times certainly helps us to communicate that, that our work is serious and important. Traditions and rules certainly help us to, to avoid some serious mistakes, no question. But what we often do in the life of the church is we begin to elevate this formality above all other concerns. And when we do that, it may make people who've been around in the church very comfortable because they're very used to it. It's very comforting to stay with that formality and that tradition, but it's very alienating to new people who walk in and don't know those forms. When we over-elevate that formality, it can suck the joy out of the life of the church. Jordan number two. Jar number three. I think this buildings. Church buildings can sap us of our joy. Now, even as I say that, I recognize that church buildings are good things. Many of our church buildings and many of our churches, they are beautiful. And, and we have here a case in point, and they are certainly useful for the ministry. But what I see happening in many congregations over and over again is that the building becomes elevated and more important than anything else. And when that happens, it begins to suck the joy out of us. I know many churches who are constrained in the ministry that they can do because in order to embrace the ministry that God is giving to them, they, have, they would have to change that building and they can't do it. Many churches are held back from who they are meant to be because their building constrains them. When the building is elevated, when it becomes an idol more important than anything else, yes, it will suck the joy and the hope out of our ministry. Jarfor. I'm going to write on this jar, I'm going to write, we've never done it like that before. We never did that before. That's an important jar in many churches, and there's another one right beside it that looks just like it. We tried that once and it didn't work. Oh, these jars are very powerful. And they are the jars that make it so hard to try something new, something creative in the life of the church. Now, I know that new things and creative things and new ideas, they are risky, they, are, they don't necessarily guarantee success, they may be a lot of work. But plan this, this idea that, that we can't try these new things, that it's just not safe enough. When we quash the spirit of the creative people among us, yes, we will destroy our joy. Last jar. I'm going to call this one the church that used to be. Oh, this is a very powerful jar in the life of the church. How much energy do we expend? How much blood and sweat and tears do we expend trying to recreate the church that we once knew, a church that is probably no longer practical in the world today? How much joy do we suck out of our achievements and successes and accomplishments of today because they just don't seem to measure up to the accomplishments of the past? The church that used to be has great power to suck the joy out of the church that is. And I know that we value and we enjoy our history and we know that many good things were done in the name of the Lord in the past and we value those things. But when the church that used to be 
starts to constrain our present and our future, it will destroy our joy. Anyways, those are my six jars. If you were to go through, perhaps you would label the jars a little bit differently. You might come up to some different conclusions, and that's fine. The particular labels on the jars are not necessarily what is important. What is important is that we recognize who we are meant to be. We are called as the church to live out our mission in joy, in this world. We are called to be the bride of Christ, the bride over whom God rejoices. So we need to be willing. If there is a tradition, if there is a ritual, if there is a religious thing that is getting in the way of that, of us living out our best identity, I'm not saying we destroy those things. Jesus didn't destroy those six sown jars. Oh, but he definitely compromised them for the sake of what really mattered. This is our challenge for the church today. Spend some time in silent reflection.